Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ. And welcome to Benson Memorial United Methodist Church on this 22nd Sunday after the day of Pentecost. And also our Consecration Sunday as part of our generosity campaign for this year. And as you might can uh, tell, we also have baptismal reaffirmation today. We will celebrate the gift of baptism and the love of God as part of our Consecration Sunday worship. It is indeed good to see all of you here. If you'll take one of those welcome pads somewhere along your row and let us know that you are here and who is worshiping, we would appreciate that. For those of you joining us online, we welcome you into this time of worship. And drop down in the comment box below the screen. Let us know who you are, where you're worshiping with us from. We want to forge a connection with you. With a few announcements, uh, we'll call your attention to events that are coming up um, in the near future. Two in particular, on the 27th of October, our Trunk or Treat will be at 4 o'clock, and we need volunteers uh, who are willing to decorate a trunk, or if not uh, decorate a trunk, at least come and sit in the parking lot and hand out candy, the all-important candy. Uh, I'll plan to make two or three trips around, uh, and, uh, but we're, we are expecting a lot of children, a lot of families this year. Uh, Courtney's told me that many invitations have gone out, and she's gotten indication that we'll see a large number of uh, young, uh, young children and their, their parents and family members out. So we do need you to uh, decorate a trunk. Let Courtney know so she can make sure there's adequate space for everyone. But uh, come out on uh, the 27th for that event. Also, want you to note our charge conference. Our annual charge conference is Saturday, November the 9th at 1230 p.m. It will be held at St. Andrew's United Methodist Church in Cary. And um, all church council members are uh, invited or expected. Uh, well, I don't know what the right word is. I guess expected to be there. Um, current church council members. Anyone can attend, though. Uh, only church council members are a, a given vote at the charge conference, but everyone is welcome to come out and attend to see what's going on, to worship together with uh, several other United Methodist churches, to be with our district superintendent. Uh, so that is on November the 9th. And finally, I just want to uh, offer a uh, sincere thank you for all the volunteers who came out yesterday and did uh, campus cleanup. It looks great. Uh, if you have not come in on the back of the church, uh, walk around there sometime uh, before you leave or sometime this week. See the new fence that's up. Uh, it looks great. Uh, and uh, the metal fence, the black metal fence was already uh repaired and uh, straightened out at an earlier cleanup day, but that new wood fence that was put up yesterday looks fantastic along with the other work, and we really appreciate the trustees and many others who come out and help make campus cleanup a success. So as we begin to worship on this Consecration Sunday, let our hearts be warm with the love of God and the hope that we get from being in the house of the Lord. Amen. <laughs>
please stand as you're able and join me in our greeting. Our Lord reigns. God is generous and grace-filled. May our generosity overflow as a living response to our God. Where we see scarcity, the Lord sees abundance. When we are afraid, God protects and provides. Praise God from whom all blessings flow today and forever. Our opening hymn is Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee in our United Methodist Hymnal on page 89. Please join me in our opening prayer. Great God in heaven, merciful Lord on earth, we humbly come to offer our praise and worship to you and ask for blessings as we give our offerings and pledges for your glory. Bid us to draw close to you so that a holy fire may be kindled in our hearts as we set the world aglow with proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ, crucified and risen, the provider of life. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading is Psalm 104, verses 1 through 9. And 24. Praise the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. 
You are clothed with splendor and majesty. He wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent and lays the beams of his upper chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot and rides on the wings of the wind. He makes winds his messengers, flames of fire his servants. He set the earth on its foundations. It can never be moved. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. But at your rebuke, the waters fled at the sound of your thunder. They took to flight. They flowed over the mountains. They went down into the valleys to the place you assigned for them. You set a boundary they cannot cross. Never again will they cover the earth. How many are your works, O Lord? In wisdom, you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. How are you? You should, you're busy already, too. You are drawing. Let me ask you a question. Do you like taking a bath? You do like taking a bath? Is that true? You like, because some kids don't like taking a bath. Oh, you got to scab. Well, I remember one time when I was very, about, t- I was a little older than you. I had told my aunt, who I spent a lot of time with, that I had taken a bath. And she looked at me, and she looked at my arm and my elbows, and she said, it looks a lot like dirt. And I said, Annie, those are bruises. <laughs> and she took me by the hand and took me right to the bathroom and washed me down with something called lye soap, <laughs> which was, we used lye soap. We made, uh, my grandmother made it, and they, the ladies made it, and we used it a lot in their house. Well, I got scrubbed down with lye soap, and those bruises, disappeared. And is and in all the years I knew her, even when I became an adult, she would ask me, the first thing she'd say, you got any bruises? And I'd say, no ma'am, no ma'am, even as an adult. Well, do you see behind me, up on the altar, what, what's that look like? What's this up here? It's water. It's water. And we're going to come up in a few minutes. Everybody's going to be invited to touch the water and take a shell because we're remembering baptism, which is a kind of bath. It doesn't wash the bruises away from our elbows and arms and knees, but it washes our hearts. And it reminds us that God loves us enough to do, to do what's necessary to make us clean. On your shoes? Yeah. <laughs> your dog, you took it. <laughs> that is, a, I'm glad that you got it back. So when you come up in a few minutes, I want you to touch this water and remember it as a bath that Jesus gives us because Jesus loves us. Okay? All right. Will you pray with me? Okay. Yep, and you can take one home in a few minutes. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we love you and thank you for the gift of baptism. We we love you, God. Amen. All right. I think I'm going to let you preach. You are. That's good. That's good. You got a lot to say.
is great. My soul is moved by glory to extol. Our God is great. Our God is great. When he reveals the shame of my transgression and gives the Well, this Consecration Sunday, we're so blessed to be given the gift of music and be blessed by the musical offerings of the choir, and we're blessed to be in the hearing of Scripture. Today, we're receiving a word from Paul's letter to the Galatians, verse, uh, chapter 6, beginning with verse 7. So I invite you to receive this living word of God as God's living people. Let it give you hope in the days ahead and inspiration this morning. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For you reap whatever you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. So then, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, and especially for those of the family of faith. And may God add a holy blessing to the reading of this precious word. Church, I invite you to pray with me. Holy Lord, as your word is proclaimed, draw close to us this morning. Fill our hearts and remind us of your love and your grace. As we hear your proclamation and are prepared to come for 
baptismal reaffirmation. Move us. Guide us. Direct us. In all the days ahead, constantly reminding us that we are yours, we are loved, and we are blessed. Now, Lord, walk among us, embrace us, touch us with your truth, fill us with your light. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I broke my left ankle while I was in the Army, doing hand-to-hand combat drills. And it was made worse by having to walk about a mile to an aid station because the medic we had on hand diagnosed me with having nothing more than a sprained ankle. An Army doctor put me in a cast that went from my foot to my hip. And that was good enough, but I woke up in the middle of the night And I felt, well, something's just not right. And so I turned on the light to see that my toes had turned a shade of dark blue, almost juke blue. They were so blue. So I was rushed by ambulance to an army hospital across the Rhine River in Wiesbaden, Germany, where I was sedated, the cast removed, the ankle reset, and I was assigned bed rest in the hospital. It was good, perhaps, that I was confined to my hospital room because a few days later, the Chernobyl nuclear plant disaster happened, and we couldn't go outside anyway during the day due to the risk of radiation falling. Well, my ankle healed, but it has never been completely right again, and the pain that I frequently have in that ankle 40 years later is a nagging reminder of my little adventure. I wore that cast for nearly four months. My leg muscles obviously atrophied and so atrophied, and so while I was glad when the cast came off, my recovery was far from complete. But the morning after my cast came off, my company was scheduled for what we called a run to the Rhine a five-mile run that was mostly downhill as we went toward the river, but just the opposite on the return. I was determined to run it. Not the smartest decision I've ever made in my life, but I was all of 19 years old, so what did I know? It wasn't long before I fell out of ranks after not running for four months and after having uh, this uh, ankle problem. Because of security issues, no one was allowed to run alone outside of the base wall. So two of my friends from my platoon dropped back to run with me. It was a slow slog, but eventually we all completed the five-mile run. And my platoon sergeant held me up as a model of endurance for everyone else. But the truth was, and I didn't say it at the time, but I wanted to quit running several times that morning. I just didn't have the strength that I had before. I was in in extreme pain. I was weary. I doubt I would have made it to the finish line at all had it not been for my friends running with me, constantly telling me, don't give up. Well, Paul reminds us today So let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. You see, weariness is like a a wet blanket we carry around these days. Weariness will drag us down to where we just want to throw in the towel and give up rather than to keep moving ahead and and forging ahead. I'm not particularly talking about physical weariness now, although I don't mean to minimize such feelings. Many of us are physically worn out, and such is certainly weariness that is hard to bear. 
but we usually can escape our physical weariness with a good night's sleep or maybe a day off. But the weariness that I'm speaking of now is a spiritual sort of weariness, evidenced by deeper symptoms not so easily shrugged off. I've talked with many folks lately who have a forbidding sense of dread about what's going to happen in a few weeks on election day. They're weary. I often speak to those who are experiencing grief from the disruption of the pandemic and all that has changed because of it. They're weary. In a lot of church meetings, Although the official process of disaffiliation is over in the United Methodist Church, I hear regretful whispers about missing friends and the churches that are no longer part of our denomination. They are weary. Just last week, I was asked by another pastor, what's going to be left? of many of our churches 10 years from now. This isn't the future I expected when I joined the ministry. He was weary, let me tell you, and his question made me weary. Yes, we are weary of being confused, weary of feeling unprepared, weary of seeming not to be enough, weary of not being able to do enough, Weary of waiting for the next shoe to drop. So I will admit it, I'm weary. How about you? Yet Brother Paul tells us to not give up. Paul isn't providing a Pollyannish platitude here. He's not giving us self-help advice or psychological counseling. He's not urging us to have a sense of optimism. He is instead pointing toward a new way of being, a way of holiness, a way to keep going even when we feel we cannot because of our weariness. We didn't read verse 6 from Galatians chapter 6 just a few moments ago, but let me share it with you now. Those who are taught the word must share in all good things with their teacher. Those who are taught the word must share all good things with their teacher. And I would ask us to pay careful attention to Paul's words because he is here offering a way that we can deal with our weariness. And the word is the way. Some scholars note that Paul is advocating in this verse for monetary support for church leaders and teachers. And in this context and in the context of the letter to the Galatians, well, that uh, interpretation can be supported. It has a lot of evidence. But I also believe that Paul is pointing us towards something far more significant, something of deeper importance something more lasting than just dollars and cents in support of the work of the church, as important as that is. Paul is pointing us believers to the very source of our salvation, Jesus Christ. Christ said to his disciples just before he went to the cross that he no longer called them his servants, but instead now knew them as his friends if they would follow his way. Jesus had made everything known to them, and if they still did not fully understand it, soon they would by seeing his battered and bruised and crucified body, not captive in a grave, but stepping out into a new day filled with the light of resurrection. And now, because of Jesus' enduring promise, we too, here and now, in this very place, share the distinction of not just being servants of Jesus Christ, but his friends as well. Those who have been taught the word must indeed share 
in all the good things with their teacher. Jesus lives, and so shall we. We may be weary today, but tomorrow something new is surely awaiting us. Death will be no more, mourning and crying will be no more, for the first things, everything that makes us weary, will have passed away. That's good news, beloved. But we must learn it. And when we grow weary, as we surely will, we are to be reminded, we need to be reminded of it over and over. You see, beloved, no one's born a Christian. We may very well be born into a Christian family. We might be surrounded by a culture that is decidedly influenced by Christianity, but no one becomes a Christian on autopilot. Every follower of Christ must make a decision for Jesus. Here is why Paul is telling us that God won't be mocked. We reap what we sow. Or to say it another way, you get what you give. Please don't misunderstand me. God is not keeping a record of every dollar pledged in the generosity campaign. God is not tracking every cent given during the offering like some heavenly accountant wearing a green eye shade, forgive me, Alan, uh, carefully checking over the ledger with our name sitting at the top of the page. But Paul warns against ignoring God because God was and is and always will be God. Those who follow Christ ought to glorify God in the church. Christ's body that is now here on earth through the offering of our prayers and our presence and our gifts and our service and our witness. You see, it's about discipleship. It's all about following Jesus. So yes, Paul points us toward the hope of salvation with an encouragement to turn away from the flesh and instead live in the joy that Christ alone brings. Paul, of course, is writing to a largely Jewish audience, or at least former Jews who now are followers of Christ. And so his words here are directed explicitly against placing one's faith solely in the act of circumcision. Paul doesn't necessarily condemn the practice, as much as he is calling for people to have a full consideration of how one is saved. Human works, no matter how laudable they are, no matter how constructive they may be, cannot save, but only Christ alone saves. Faith in Christ alone saves. This metaphor of sowing and reaping, then is used by Paul to turn these early Christians from focusing on themselves and what they can do and turn them instead toward seeing what God can do through them. Not only is this a proper orientation for a Christian faith, but it is also our answer when we want to know how to throw off our weariness. When we think it's over, when we feel there is no way forward, when despair grips us tight and fear fills our hearts, what appears to us as an end is just a starting place for God. God never encounters an obstacle that God cannot overcome. God never faces a roadblock that cannot be crossed. When the world says there is no way, give up, God says here is a way, keep going. Have faith and do not grow weary in doing what is right. Friends, today is Consecration Sunday, a day when we are asked to make our pledge of financial support for the church. And I know some may wonder if giving is worth the trouble at all. 
What real good will my gift do? What difference will it make? Some of you may be thinking, does the church even have a future? Am I throwing good money after bad money? Let me tell you, all this anxiety is bound to make us weary. And when we become weary, the temptation is to turn inward, to become defensive in our posture, to be paralyzed by our scarcity rather than animated by God's abundance. Weariness robs us of fresh imagination and makes us skeptical about the future. Weariness makes us afraid tightly closing our doors instead of flinging them open in radical welcome. Weariness makes us cling to the tried and true, captured by the anesthetizing nostalgia, blinding us to all the ways that God is attempting to do new things in our very midst at this very hour. In short, beloved, weariness makes us see only what we can do and not have a hope in what God can and will do. So as you are asked, as you do today, take another step. Offering your financial pledges for next year, and along with it, your promise to also support the church with your prayers and presence and service and witness. Don't be weary. Don't be convinced it doesn't matter that we are bound to fail, that the odds are against us, that the circumstances are too hostile, that our hill that we face is too high to climb. Do not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will surely weep at harvest time if we do not give up. Let's keep awake to the opportunities before us working for the good of all. Let's together take another step. Let's remember the grace we received in baptism. Let's remember God's love and celebrate that the Spirit is alive in our hearts. Let's have hope. Let's not grow weary. Let's not give up. We've got Jesus. And Jesus has been so good to us. Glory to God. Amen. I invite you now to stand as you're able, as we profess what it is we believe. This morning we will affirm our faith using the Apostles' Creed on page 881 of your United Methodist Hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And because Jesus has been so good to us, I invite you to turn to your neighbor and greet them with this sign, the peace of Christ be with you. And for those of you online, the peace of Christ be with you.
Turn to your neighbor now and offer them the peace. may be seated. And I'll invite you to turn in your United Methodist hymnals to page 50 for our service of baptismal reaffirmation. It is important to note as we enter into this moment that in our church, in the United Methodist Church, we do not rebaptize. That is not true for every denomination, for every tradition. Maybe some of you have attended churches uh, at points in your life where they did rebaptism. But United Methodists have a strong uh, belief that it is not necessary. And we believe this because, I'll summarize, I won't say it eloquently, but God doesn't make mistakes. The first time counts. And that's all that's needed. And we can rejoice in that to, to, because God is faithful through thick and thin. And so we come to the baptismal reaffirmation. Even though we do not rebaptize, there are times that we need to be reminded of God's promise. And we need to be reminded of our promises to God. And so we do that today. In a few moments, you'll be invited to come forward and touch the water. Take a shell if you'd like. Once you touch the water, you may simply uh, hold the drops in your hand or you may make a sign of the cross on your forehead. Whatever you choose to do. Whatever is efficacious to you to remember this wonderful gift that God has given. Also, as you come forward, you're invited to bring your pledge card, and I hope many of you, all of you, have completed that. And as you touch the water and are reminded of God's love, you may leave your pledge here in the basket in the middle here. Uh, if you are not ready to do that, if you have not completed the card or if you've forgotten it, don't worry, we'll make room for you. Later on, we'll, we'll receive your pledge card anytime. And Alan is waving. There's more in the back. If you need one, uh, please let him know, and one will be provided. But we do ask you to take seriously this time of pledging, this time of taking another step to respond to what God is doing and what God might do through us. If you have not been baptized, you are invited to still come forward and anticipate your baptism rather than remember it. If you do not have your pledge card, you still are most certainly invited to come forward and touch the water, feel its coolness, and celebrate what God has done. And for those of you joining us online, we sincerely hope that you will remember your baptism so now, turning to page 50, brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift, offered to us without price. Through the reaffirmation of our faith, we renew the covenant declared at our baptism. Acknowledge what God is doing for us and affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. So on behalf of the whole church across the ages, through the lives of the saints, through all the servants of the church, as they gather and look down upon us in this holy moment, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? please respond by saying, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, 
Put your whole trust in His grace and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. According to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve it as Christ's, uh, Christ's representative in the world? over on page 51, we'll give thanksgiving over the water. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Tell of God's mercy, you say. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Pour out your Holy Spirit, and by this gift of water, call uh, to our remembrance the grace declared to us in our baptism. For you have washed away our sins, and you clothe us with righteousness throughout our lives, that dying and rising with Christ, we may share in his final victory. All praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, with you and the Holy Spirit, lives and reigns forever. Amen. Friends, I now invite you to come forward as you are able to either one of these bowls and simply touch the water, remember your baptism, and be thankful. Come forward. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Remember your baptism. Remember your baptism. Remember your baptism. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Remember your baptism. Remember your baptism and be thankful. 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 Remember your Remember your baptism and be thankful. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Remember your baptism. Yeah. 
his Let us offer our thanksgiving. You may find it on page, the bottom of page 53. Let us rejoice in the faithfulness of our covenant God. We give thanks for all that God has already given us as members of the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church. We will faithfully participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service and witness, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. The grace of God be with you always. Amen. And in this time of generosity, when we remember all that God has done for us, when we have pledged our support for the mission and ministry of this church next year, let us not forget that we are called to be generous each time we gather for worship. So the ushers should come forward now, and we should offer the weekly offering of our tithes and offerings. If you are online and would like for us to, would like to support the work of this church, if you want to recognize and respond to what God's doing in your life, there are ways to give online or by mail. Simply go to our website and discover how. Let us be generous. Let us respond to God's grace. Come forward.
Holy Lord, be glorified. Be glorified as we respond to your constant love and care and grace. Just as we are washed clean in the waters of baptism, may we constantly be reminded that we are not alone in this world. You are with us. And because of that, we have the assurance and the hope for the future. Lord, we love you. Guide us, multiply these gifts, and give us the wisdom to use them to proclaim your word and to do missions of mercy in many places. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you all to remain standing as we join together for our closing hymn, number 73 in your United Methodist hymnals, O Worship the King. Beloved, remember your baptism and be thankful. Go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In peace, let us.